You're listening to The Unsafe Bible with Pastor Ken Brown. If we are faithless, He remains faithful, for He cannot deny Himself. No matter what I do, no matter where I've been, no matter how I've blown it, God is still there. He still promises in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, He's faithful and just to forgive us, cleanses of all unrighteousness, and just brings us right back into fellowship with Him because he's faithful. Nothing I've done is like nothing Israel's done, yet he still has a plan for them, and he still has a plan for me. Have you ever blown it, like big time? So bad that you were losing sleep over what you were afraid was going to happen because of what you did. But then, somehow, it all worked out. Everything you expected to happen didn't, and you were able to breathe a huge sigh of relief. In today's message, Pastor Ken teaches you about how God's goodness far surpasses the worst mistakes you've ever made. Even when you find yourself failing time and time again, His grace is able to help you back up. Well, let's join Pastor Ken in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 16, as he continues his message, Jerusalem. God even is letting them know what you're doing politically, what you're doing morally, what you're doing abandoning me and giving to these other gods is really weird because you're paying money to do it. Why would you do that? I'm not saying that we're paying money to allow everybody to come in here, but I don't know where we buy our gas from. But I think it comes from the Middle East. God interrupts himself, by the way, in his discussion here by saying how angry he truly is with Jerusalem. There's a sudden outburst, and he moves on to why he's angry. His outburst is, you're not even like everybody else. You're paying them money. God's upset, and he's pointing it out. These verses expand on Jerusalem's high-handed behavior is what we're seeing. Jerusalem has broken the general accepted norms of a prostitute's behavior by scorning payment. So he's comparing them to a prostitute, but they don't want to get paid for it. They pay someone, which is kind of weird. You know, they're selling themselves, but they're selling themselves and then saying, oh, do you want 100 for it or 200? Uh, That's what they're doing. Second, as a married woman, now Israel belongs to God. And in the scriptures it says God is the husband, Israel is the wife. says that over and over and over again. She's committing adultery by receiving strangers instead of her own husband, Yahweh. That's what Hosea, the whole book of Hosea is about. It talks about that with the relationship he has with his wife, and God points out that's what the nation of Israel is doing. The expression zarim, which shows up again, the prostitute word, can be interpreted two levels. It identifies people who don't belong, in this case primarily to one's own family or household, but it also applies to enemies of the nation. And the word specifically is applying with the prostitution that they're doing politically to Egyptians, Assyrians, and Babylonians. They're not supposed to be dealing with those people, but they have treaties with them. And they've replaced God with these treaties. Not that we know of any nations that are doing that locally, that are replacing God with treaties, but I mean, that's what Israel was. Third, Jerusalem had reversed the customary roles of payer and payee in harlotrous relationships. They were selling themselves and then paying for the action. And again, God is talking in terms of politics and talking about aligning with international relationships and things like that, but normally it's a mutual benefit situation or they actually need your protection. No, Israel's paying everybody for whatever they want. Jerusalem has scorned the payment that normally would be paid for a woman's sexual favors. Worse yet, they're bribing them to satisfy her lust, stifling all sense of shame and inverting the normal roles of prostitute and client. God's pointing that out and he's saying, that's not even normal. What you're doing is not even normal. The resources that God had given them, Israel turns around and gives to everybody else. Says, here's my money, here's my gold, here's my, here's this, here's this, here's this, here's my, here's our treasure, here's the lives of our soldiers, here's the, I mean, you know, that's what Israel was doing. We do the same thing, unfortunately. Rather than relying on the Lord for protection, which has been in the case in the past, the nation was now buying protection by paying tribute to nations that she thought would protect her. 
Assyria, Egypt, and Babylon. You know, it's kind of like, okay, Egypt, you could compare Egypt to at that time because they couldn't be trusted in any international relationship at that time. It'd be like setting a relationship with Russia. Maybe they'll show up, maybe they won't. Assyria, they, they act like the Nazis and actually were worse than the Nazis. And Babylon, they didn't care. They just killed everybody and took over. Ezekiel 16, starting in verse 35, therefore, God's still going on about this, therefore, O harlot, he's no longer calling it Jerusalem, he's now calling it a harlot, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, because your lewdness was poured out and your nakedness uncovered through your harlotries with your lovers and with all your detestable idols, and because of the blood of your sons which you gave to idols, therefore, behold, I will gather all your lovers with whom you took pleasure, even all those whom you loved and all those whom you hated. I'll gather them against you from every direction and expose your nakedness to them so that they may see all your nakedness. Thus I will judge you like women who commit adultery or shed blood are judged. And I'll bring on you the blood of wrath and jealousy. I will also give you into the hands of your lovers and they'll tear down your shrines, demolish your high places, strip you of your clothing, take away your jewels, and will leave you naked and bare. They will incite a crowd against you, and they will stone you and cut you to pieces with their swords. They will burn your houses with fire and execute judgments on you in the sight of many women. Then I will stop you from playing the harlot, and you will no longer pay your lovers. So I'll calm my fury against you, and my jealousy will depart from you, and I will be pacified and angry no more. Because you've not remembered the days of your youth, but have enraged me by all these things. Behold, I in turn will bring your conduct down on your own head, declares the Lord God, so that you will not commit this lewdness on top of all your other abominations. So their punishments for the nation of Israel, God's using this picture of prostitution, talking about the nation. The nation had committed those sins, so therefore he's talking about the punishments as being the ones that are outlined in the law for prostitution and adultery and idolatry. The way it lines it up in Leviticus, adulterers and adulteresses are stoned. It says that in Leviticus 20. Idolaters were killed by the sword and their possessions were burned. That's in Deuteronomy chapter 13. God uses the Babylonian army to inflict these judgments on the people of Israel. Many of the people of Israel at that time, in Jerusalem specifically, were slain by the sword. That's the punishment outlined in Deuteronomy 13 for idolatry. Then their houses were burned. The temple was burned after all the priests were killed by the sword. And the city of Jerusalem and the temple were looted and burned. Those are all punishments for idolatry. The scripture is pretty consistent. You notice that I talked about that stoning is a punishment for adultery and adulteresses. It's also a punishment for teaching false gods or believing false worship. Uh, and it's always intriguing to me that in the book of Revelation we see hailstones, huge hailstones falling on people who won't worship God. God's consistent. He's still stoning them in the future. Doesn't change. Verse 44 of Ezekiel 16. Behold, everyone who quotes Proverbs will quote this proverb concerning you, saying, like mother, like daughter. You're the daughter of your mother who loathed her husband and children. You're also the sister of your sisters who loathed their husbands and children. Your mother was a Hittite, and your father was an Amorite. Remember, we learned in the first section that Jerusalem was originally from Amorite and Hittite background, so he's going back to that. Now, your older sister is Samaria, who lives north of you with her daughters, and your younger sister, who lives south of you, is Sodom with her daughters. Yet you've not merely walked in their ways or done according to their abomination. So he's pointing to the northern kingdom, which is already in captivity, and he's pointing to Sodom, which was destroyed. But if it was too little, he's saying that they had their own abominations, they had their own problems, but as if that were too little, you acted more corruptly in all their conduct than they. As I live, declares the Lord God, Sodom, your sister and her daughters, have not done as you and your daughters have done. Behold, this is the guilt of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters had arrogance, abundant food, and careless ease, but she did not help the poor and needy. Thus they were haughty and committed abominations before me. Therefore, I removed them when I saw fit. Furthermore, Samaria, this is the northern kingdom, didn't commit half of your sins, for you've multiplied your abominations more than they. Thus, you've made your sisters appear righteous 
I hear all your abominations which you've committed. Stop and think about that for a minute. God is telling Israel, you're so bad, you make the people who lived in Sodom look righteous. That's what he's saying. That's not a good thing to be called, I think. You're so bad, you look worse than the people who were in the northern kingdom who are in captivity now. He's kind of laying it out. But also, bear your disgrace in that you've made judgment favorable for your sisters because of your sins in which you acted more abominably than they. They are more in the right than you. Yes, be also ashamed and bear your disgrace in that you made your sisters appear righteous. I'm reminded of a quote from Billy Graham. This is from 20 years ago. He was making a comment about events occurring in the United States and how we've become the purveyor of all things that God abhors. And he made a comment saying, if God does not judge this nation, he will have to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. Because notice what he talks about the nation of Israel. And you start comparing what's going on in this nation and you start studying what went on in Sodom and Gomorrah and you're going like, gee, I don't know. I mean, how far gone are we? The sin of Jerusalem and by application Judah, as we said, made Sodom and the northern kingdom appear to be righteous. They weren't. Moses made it really, really clear but the people didn't remember, and people don't remember today either. They don't like to be reminded of what God says. Deuteronomy 6.10 It shall come about when the Lord your God brings you into the land which he swore to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you great and splendid cities which you did not build, houses full of all good things which you did not fill, and hewn cisterns which you did not dig, vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant, and you eat and are satisfied. Then watch yourselves, that you do not forget the Lord who brought you from the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery. You shall fear only the Lord your God, and you shall worship him and swear by his name. You shall not follow other gods, any of the gods of the peoples who surround you, for the Lord your God in the midst of you is a jealous God. Otherwise, the anger of the Lord your God will be kindled against you, and he will wipe you off the face of the earth. How's that for a promise? You know, I mean, it's really something. But everything the nation had been warned against, they did. Don't do this, they did it. Don't do that, they did that too. We actually have some of that today embodied in industries that actually are insured and make all kinds of money and they involved in, but it's still, it's sin. They were so much like the world that the surrounding nations were embarrassed of them. They were doing worse than what the surrounding nations did. I mean, you know, the Philistines were pretty good sinners and idolaters, but when they're embarrassed about what's going on in Israel, okay, that's not good. How's the church of today doing? How are we doing today as a church globally? Are we still holy and separate to God? Or have we also started finding ourselves going the same direction of the nation of Israel? This is what the Barna Group found in 2010. We learned that more than half of all born-again adults also believe that cohabitation is morally appropriate. Half say that entertaining sexual fantasies about someone other than one's spouse is morally acceptable. And one-third condone the use of profanity in public and the viewing of pornography. This was in 2010. Deeper analysis of the data showed that the segments of unchurched adults who are most at risk were men, people under 35, upscale adults, and people who attend large churches. Consequently, what we've defined as a biblical worldview, and in other words, as believers, we say there are things that we, as Christians, that we agree on that consider is a biblical worldview. And one of those is, is absolute moral truth exists. God's word is absolute moral truth. It exists, right? Yes. The Bible is totally accurate in all the principles it teaches. It has to be. Satan is a real being or force. He is not symbolic. He is a person. People cannot earn their way into heaven by being good or by good works. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me, period. Jesus Christ lived a sinless life on this earth, died and rose again. He's at the right hand of the Father. God is the all-knowing, all-powerful creator of the world and still rules the universe today. Now, those are all things that we as believers would agree on. There are some other things that we might disagree on, but this is what we call the essentials in many cases. I would be first to say that a truly biblical worldview contains a lot more than that, and at the very least, we can agree that our approach 
overestimates how many people have a robust biblical-centered view of the world and their role in it. But overall, in the United States, only 9% of American adults believe that. That was in 2010. While born-again Christians are twice as likely to possess a biblical worldview, and the same Barna survey said that born-again Christians were in excess of 50% of the population. What he found, though, is that the people who believe that is 19% of all born-again believers believe the essentials of the Christian faith. That's sad. What happened to Israel? They stopped believing the essentials of following God, and they started believing the lie. What's happening in the church today? Why do we need revival? That's why. It's because as a nation, as a people, we're turning away from God. We're not following him. And Ezekiel is giving a warning to folks 2,500 years ago that still rings today. Verse 53 of Ezekiel 16. Nevertheless, I will restore their captivity, the captivity of Sodom and her daughters, the captivity of Samaria and her daughters, and along with them your own captivity, in order that you may bear your humiliation and feel ashamed for all that you've done when you become a consolation to them. Your sisters, Sodom with her daughters and Samaria with her daughters, will return to their former state, and you with your daughters will also return to your former state. As the name of your sister Sodom was not heard for your lips in a day of pride before your wickedness was uncovered, so now you have become the reproach of the daughters of Edom and of all who are around her and of the daughters of the Philistines, those surrounding you who despise you. You've borne the penalty of your lewdness and abominations, the Lord declares. For thus says the Lord God, I will also do with you as you've done, you who have despised the oath by breaking the covenant. Nevertheless, I will remember my covenant with you in the days of your youth, and I will establish an everlasting covenant with you. Then you'll remember your ways and be ashamed when you receive your sisters, both your older and your younger, and I'll give them to you as daughters, but not because of your covenant. Thus I will establish my covenant with you, and you shall know that I am the Lord, so that you may remember and be ashamed and never open your mouth anymore because of your humiliation when I've forgiven you for all that you've done, the Lord God declares. He's saying that the fortunes of Israel will be restored. Yes, they're going to be punished for their sin. And we talked about the fact that God outlined in Leviticus, in Exodus, in Numbers, in Deuteronomy, the different punishments for different types of sins and the nation's busy doing them, so God's going to visit those punishments on them. But they're going to be restored, they're going to return to the land, and they're going to rebuild the temple. And that did indeed happen. They were in captivity for 70 years, they did return to the land, not all of them, but some. They did rebuild the temple, but they never were quite independent as a nation again. There is going to be a future restoration for Israel. They're back in the land again. They want to rebuild the temple again. In fact, the high priest was just appointed by the Sanhedrin, which has been reconstructed. There are plans that have already been drawn up for construction of the temple. It hasn't started yet, but they're ready to go. They also found a carving from 700 AD in Arabic that said it was the place of the Jews. Yeah, anyway. But there will be a future restoration that will indeed be based on the covenant God made with the nation. The Lord has made it clear that this restoration and reunion that's going to take place is not because of any covenant made at Sinai, and it's totally and completely God's grace. It has nothing to do with the law. He says that. This is not because of a covenant, it's because of his grace. The nation broke the covenant, but God through his grace is going to remember the covenant. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. This is still coming for the nation of Israel. I will pour out on the house of David, on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and of supplication, so that they will look on me, whom they have pierced, and they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son, and they will weep bitterly over him like the bitter weeping of a firstborn. In that day there will be a great mourning in Jerusalem, like the mourning of Hadrimmon in the plain of Megiddo. The land will mourn, every family by itself, the family of the house of David by itself, and their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Nathan by itself, and their wives by themselves, the family of the house of Levi by itself, and their wives by themselves, and the family of the Shemites by itself, and their wives by themselves, all the families that remain, every family by itself, and their wives by themselves. There's a day coming when the nation of Israel will see their Lord, and it says they will see him who they pierced, And they'll recognize him and they'll all cry over that. 
And the Lord says elsewhere in the scripture at that point, they, he will put a new heart in them and the nation at that point will be his never to ever drift off again because he has physically shown up on planet earth to save them. But the Lord promises, and he's saying it here, and he does it in other places in Scripture as well, and we'll talk a little bit more about it as we move further in Ezekiel. He promised to establish his new covenant with his people, and they would know that he was God, that he was Yahweh, and he would do it to humble his people and stimulate them to obey him by demonstrating forgiveness. The one thing we have to remember, because I don't know about you, I blow it all the time, and I have to come and talk to the Lord and he has promised this in 2 Timothy 2.13. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. No matter what I do, no matter where I've been, no matter how I've blown it, God is still there. He still promises in 1 John 1, 1.9, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us, cleanses us of all unrighteousness, and just brings us right back into fellowship with him. Because he's faithful. It's nothing I've done, just like nothing Israel's done, yet he still has a plan for them, and he still has a plan for me. God's sovereign choices here in verse 60. I will remember my covenant with you. It's his choice. It's not Israel's choice. It's God's choice. I will establish an everlasting covenant with you. It's a new covenant he's talking about. That's referred to in Jeremiah chapter 31. It's also, we'll get to it in Ezekiel chapter 36. I said we'll talk about it later. We'll get to it when we get to 36. Here's another choice. He says, when I have forgiven you for all that you've done, God chooses to forgive. At the right time, as it says in Romans, he died for me and for you. And he did it at the right time. The actions of the people, the nation of Israel, what they're supposed to do, you will remember your ways. And you will be ashamed. He's saying, you're going to remember what happened you're going to remember, this is what Ezekiel's telling them, you're going to remember this day. You're going to remember what I'm saying. You're going to remember where you've been. It's no different for them than us. When we repent and return to the Lord, he lifts us right up. We remember our ways, but he also says, therefore there is now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. The moment we ask him to forgive us, he does, and we go on. Romans 5, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we exult in the hope of the glory of God. God has a future for the nation. He has a future for us. And we're getting some sense as we see Ezekiel talking exactly what the sins of the nation are and why they're going to be judged, but there is a future for the nation, and he's talking about it. The thing that's exciting is that we're beginning to see portions of that future beginning to take place even now. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for showing us clearly in your scriptures how and why you're dealing with Israel the way you are. And we also see in how you deal with them, how you deal with us. We see your grace. We see that you still love them, but you punish sin. We thank you for the fact that you have dealt with the sin issue with us through grace, through the death and resurrection of our Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, that we can come to you and that you freely forgive and that you want us to have a relationship with us and you want us to be in constant communication with you. Thank you for this time in your word. Just help us to continue to study your word and look to you as the author and finisher of our faith. We just ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Today's message was in the book of Ezekiel. Pastor Ken continues his teaching from this major prophet here on the Unsafe Bible. Ezekiel provides many reminders of what it means to be a Christian. Even more impressive is how relevant his example is even today. Not only did he embody what would later be known as a disciple, but he spoke of the end times that would later be penned in the book of Revelation. He also embodies what we mean when we say the Unsafe Bible. The Jews were saved by faith and blessed with a paradise to live in. This was not popular among the locals, and so little by little they began to deny their faith and take credit for themselves. This gained them favor with the world, but God took notice and knew what he must do. You see, the life of a Christian is not an easy one. 
Not only do you have to deny yourself things of this world, but the world begins to look at you differently, and that can be uncomfortable at times. We want to help you navigate what it means to be a Christian today and to walk in lockstep with God. Visit our website, theunsafebible.com, for more information about us and the Bible. You can connect with us by filling out the Connect form right on the main page. You'll find directions to our campus on the About tab under Contact Us. There's also a link to our email address where you can ask questions or leave a prayer request. We can't wait to hear from you and start a conversation. But for now, we're out of time. Be sure to come back for more from Pastor Ken on the Unsafe Bible.